As the Perth US Asia Centre kicks off 2021, we're delighted to welcome on board a senior policy fellow, fellow based not here in Perth, but in Canberra, Haley Channer. So I thought it'd be nice for us to sit down together and have a brief conversation to share with our broader community uh, to, to let you all know a little bit more about Haley. So Haley, uh, just give us a little bit of your background uh, to kick off the conversation. Gordon, thank you so much. As you know, I'm very excited to have joined the Perth US Asia team and my background is a very diverse one. So I've just recently left the Department of Defence where I was for five years. Prior to that, I worked in a minister's office up at Parliament House. I also have a background working for Australia's largest not-for-profit organisation, World Vision Australia. Mm. And prior to that, I have a background in think tanks, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and Australian Institute of International Affairs. So I'm very happy to get back to my think tank roots here at Perth US Asia. Well, as somebody who's never had a real job, in other words, I've worked my entire career only in the think tank community, I can say welcome back to the think tank community. Uh, as you, as you re-enter in this space, uh, tell us what your priorities are going to be. What do you want to focus on? Mm -hmm. So having just left government, I'm very eager to get my voice out there. And I think there are a couple of really important strategic policy questions facing Australia today that I want to have some commentary and input to. So the very first project I'll be looking at has to do with infrastructure and it's inspired by China's Belt and Road Initiative. So my thinking around that is at the moment there are a lot of um, developing countries in our region in Southeast Asia and the Pacific that have a growing middle class and are desperate for new infrastructure, both hard and soft infrastructure. At the moment, the only option that they have for loans to build their bridges, roads, ports, um, and the like is China's Belt and Road Initiative funding. So I think it's really important that other countries like Australia, the United States and Japan work with the private sector more to be able to partner on these kind of infrastructure mm -hmm. projects to be able to give countries in the region some alternatives. So that's project number one, Cab Off the Rank. Um, the other thing I would like to do has to do with reflecting on the Trump administration four years of US foreign and defence policy in our region and how that has impacted US allies in the region. So looking at the mindset and uh, policy changes, if there have been any in Australia, Japan and perhaps South Korea. And then the final project mm. I would like to look at has to do with Australia investing more resources, time and energy into really critical partnerships in our region. That includes Japan, India and Indonesia. Well, I, I look forward to being both a partner to distribute that research, but consuming it myself. <laughs> uh, in your last point, you mentioned a focus particularly on Japan, Indonesia, India. Why those three countries? Mm. That's a great question. Um, in the past, I've actually looked more at Australia, Japan, South Korea. And I've actually, in the last couple of years, had more of an interest looking at large countries like India and Indonesia, who have very large populations. The reason I have focused in on those three countries in particular Importantly is I think Japan, India and Indonesia, Australia as well, we're all founded on democratic values and interests. So I think you need to have that foundation before you can actually think about what other things you would like to do together. And while Australia um, has a very close relationship with Japan, and so close I would say it's our second most important defence and security mm. partner, if you look at the gulf between defence cooperation with our main ally, the United States, and defence cooperation with Japan, there is a massive gulf. And I think Australia needs to bridge that. And importantly for India and Indonesia, there is a long history of good cooperation, but with Indonesia it is mainly focused on national security issues like um, counter-terrorism and also uh, transnational crime. I'd like to see it move more into the defence and security space in our region. And indeed India, which is this massive global power, is really coming into its own. We also need to think about how we're working more with India. And I'm really pleased to see that Australia was invited back to the maritime exercise Malabar and that we've also had um, a renewed quad meeting. So that's my last project. Well, you won't be surprised to know that every one of those coincide very much with our priorities here at the Perth US Asia Centre. So that makes us happy and doubly <laughs> delighted that you're going to be filling that role because I think you're spot on. Not only is there a gulf in terms of the gap between Australia's cooperation with its most important ally, the United States, and the other countries in the region, but there's also here in Australia a, a, a gulf of understanding. Uh, and, and so the more that we as an institution can help understand the growing importance of Indonesia, the obvious importance of India, the continued importance of Japan, as well as other countries in the region, the more we're going to be contributing to that policy dialogue. Now having said that, 
Um, the United States remains critical, uh, and the last four years have been a unique challenge. And so the, the fact that your tenure in government covered a good chunk of, uh, of, of the relationship with the United States, I'd rather have you look forward, right? Uh, because the last four years, I think there's going to be a lot of people spending the time you know, trying to, to slice and dice and analyze what happened and how we responded to it. There were some unique challenges in that era. Um, probably less in the security space than in the economic space or the diplomatic space or the human rights space and or the multilateral space. But having said that, uh, the U.S.-Australia alliance is is at a very interesting turning point. Uh, the, the Trump era now turns out to have been bookended at four years. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Biden, uh, at the time of this taping, is, is less than 24 hours away from being inaugurated. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you'd give us your take of the future of Australia-US relations? Mm. Huge question. Mm. Um, probably no surprise to you, Gordon, that I think it has a very bright future. Um, I think reflecting back on the most recent um, events that we've seen in the US Capitol building in, in early January, I think that it's um, understandable that a lot of Australians, as well as people around the world, would have looked on at those scenes in the Capitol building and the violence and been shocked and really upset about what they saw. And some may even be asking, um, are we really going to stay a strong ally of the United States when it's in such political, social um, and other upheaval? Um, and shouldn't we have a more independent foreign and defence policy? Mm. Um, and while those questions you know, might be justified at this time, I think the most important thing to note, a couple of things. Um, we have always had an independent foreign defence policy. The reason we have always been with the United States in certain military and other conflicts is because at the heart of it, Australian and US values are extremely closely aligned. And having uh, President Trump in the White House for the last four years has definitely been a challenging time across the spectrum. But one president isn't the whole relationship. And in fact, mm. the strategic dynamics in our region now mean that now more than ever before, we need to have closer defence and security cooperation with the United States, remind the United States about the importance of the Indo-Pacific region and also about the importance of Western Australia and Perth. I mean, you look at um, HMAS Stirling and the opportunities that there are for maritime exercises here in our region. So I think there's a lot more opportunity, a lot more that we can do beyond having Marines in Darwin. And I think Australia should be really excited about what the prospects are for a Biden administration going forward. We had a, an event this morning where we hosted the uh, leader of the opposition, Anthony Albanese, for kind of a foreign policy speech. And we were joined afterwards for a panel discussion, which included uh, the current member for Brand, the current shadow trade minister, Madeleine King, who was uh, founding CEO of our center here. She made an interesting observation that despite her own deep support for the alliance, that there's a bit of a generational challenge here. Mm. And that if, if you have come of age politically uh, in Australia for the last four years, or even candidly longer than that, mm -hmm. your view of the United States might be fundamentally different than somebody who had experiences during the war years or during the Cold War even, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you might give us a little bit of insights in terms of the generational challenge uh, that Australia faces, particularly after four years of Trump, in mm -hmm. making the case that you just so articulately made in terms of, uh, of the alliance. So your peers and mm -hmm. the younger generation coming up behind you as well. Well, it's a very interesting question. I mean, I'm obviously biased because I'm part of the Australia-America Young Leadership Dialogue and I'm surrounded often by huge supporters of the Australia-US Alliance and the relationship writ large. Um, and I have fantastic personal connections with Americans all over the country and I've traveled America a lot and love America. Uh, but you look at other people and they do have a very different um, perspective. I think depending on where you live in Australia, um, your priorities, maybe if you've got a business focus or you know, a different focus to foreign affairs and defence. Um, and I think it's a difficult question to ask for people that aren't familiar with the massive benefits of our military alliance, the intelligence sharing that we have. Perhaps there's people that don't really understand how significant the shifts in the region are at the moment that don't understand how important it is to maintain and strengthen this relationship with the United States. Um, obviously, the US has fantastic soft power and younger generations still love um, American music and TV um, and other cultural influences 
and they'll always want to go to America to travel to see these places that they've seen in the movies. But beyond that, there does mm. need to be more of an understanding within the upcoming generation who are going to be the leaders of the future um, about why the US is still so important and the fact that this last four years is really uncharacteristic in the history of the United States and that it's not a full stop on the US leadership um, in the region. It's just a dot, dot, dot. I like that. You know, for the, <laughs> unfortunately, for the last four years, the dot, dot, dot have, have come to characterize a certain individual's Twitter habits. <laughs> uh, um, but I do think that y y you're, you're spot on, that, that there is more of the story to come, and I mm -hmm. think we're going to see that in the next couple of years. Um, you're a Queenslander, uh, so the, you know, while it's the, the far coast from Western Australia, in some respects, it's a, a sister from another mother in terms of that regard, not in Canberra, but you've now spent a, a good chunk of time in Canberra. I wonder if you might help us kind of reflect on on the the Canberra bubble, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, obviously, when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to defense policy, when it comes to, to international relations more broadly, aid, assistance, many of those decisions are being made in Canberra, not in Queensland, either not mm -hmm. here in Perth. The center that, that uh, we're both part of now was set up on several presumptions. And one of those, uh, as I mentioned earlier this morning in a different event, was that there was a critical mass of global caliber strategic thinkers in Perth mm -hmm. that warranted a think tank, but also that the perspectives that we have here are sufficiently different from those that you have in Canberra as to warrant kind of an Indo-Pacific, mm -hmm. Australia's Indian Ocean capital type of perspective. Uh, but still, the, the fundamental fact remains that for the classic model of a think tank, Perth is the wrong place. Normally, you would have a think tank uh, in, in, in Tokyo or in Seoul or in London or in Washington, D.C., where you have that daily interaction uh, with government. Uh, in our seven years, we've been quite pleased with you know, the tremendous support we received out of Canberra and our effort to push those perspectives back into Canberra. But one, we're delighted now to have you know, our woman in Canberra, shall we say, shall we say someone <laughs> there to help us get a better sense of the milieu. Mm -hmm. uh, so give us a little bit of a preview of, of your role in Canberra uh, the, the community there that we're trying to influence, that we're trying to support. Mm -hmm. Well, when I first moved to Canberra from Queensland and specifically from the Gold Coast, I moved in winter and it was an awful experience. <laughs> um, in fact, I was so unfamiliar with Canberra that the deciduous trees I just thought were dead, dead trees in Canberra. But it's been 10 <laughs> years now and actually I've come to love Canberra, although I wouldn't tell my Gold Coast friends that. <laughs> Um, but Canberra is a fantastic place because it does bring together lots of really passionate, driven people. Um, when I joined, when I moved to Canberra, I started working at think tanks and I never saw myself working in government because I thought I was too outspoken and too opinionated. And I'm still those things. But when I moved into government, I realised there was a, a different ways to promote Australia's inter interests while you're in government. And I know having worked with a lot of public servants, that they are extremely passionate and eager for expertise, which they often don't have time to access because of the regular churn of government um, operations, the frequent dialogues that we have, and now that we're in this COVID era, um, online, everything moving online. So they're very busy people, but they really need and crave expertise like what Perth US Asia can offer them. So why I'm so happy to work for Perth US Asia is because we have something unique to all of those think tanks that you mentioned, whether they be on the East Coast or in DC or London or elsewhere. And the reason that is, is because a lot of those think tanks are focusing on the two major players, the United States and China. But if we are really going to be a strong ally and supporter of the United States and be a good alliance partner, we really need to provide the US with expertise, advice and information on our own region and Perth US Asia is offering that expertise in our commentary on Japan, mm. South Korea, India, Indonesia, and Vietnam. So whereas a lot of other th centers are just focused on the major players, we are focused on the other countries that are just as significant in many ways, but aren't getting as much airtime. So I'm very eager to talk to my former colleagues in uh, government departments to provide them with this quality product and tell them here is the expertise that you need to influence your thinking around this government policy, uh, go forth and make government a policy. So I'm looking forward to that and um, really pleased to be the woman in Canberra. Well, spot on. Thank you. Your, your response makes me reflect on the, the 
25 years I spent in Washington, D.C. Uh, it, it, is illery, it is easy, rather, on, on, in uh, other parts of the country to kind of look at the policymaking center and pillory it as some type of a place of, of corruption. But uh, you know, you're focused on the passion of individuals. You're focused on, on the, the level of expertise, particularly in the civil service, whether it's, not, whether it's nonpartisan, who really care about issues and who are trying to do their best. Uh, it really rings true to me. Um, you know, despite the horrific events in Washington, D.C., over the, the, the last several weeks, um, you know, behind that are a lot of genuinely sincere people who care about the country. So we're delighted that you're there and we're delighted that you're part of our team. Uh, we look forward to kind of working with you as we go forward. Uh, there's an awful lot of work to be done. Uh, and you've highlighted it uh, extremely well. So welcome to the Perth US Asia Center and to our, our broader Perth US Asia Center community. We hope you uh, enjoy Haiti's commentary, her research, her analysis as we go forward and we look to uh, look forward to engaging with you in person as well as online. Thanks.